this is Sean Smith from Clover Lake, right. and the library the uh, and I've already forgotten the right. <laughs> the part that's the Lancashire Lancashire Medical that's Fellowship, right. yeah. and it's um, Clover Leaf have been employed to consult. Is that right? Well, a service has been commissioned yeah. and Cloverleaf have kind of been awarded that uh, contract, so to speak. But Cloverleaf are an advocacy service who are like, it's a broad spectrum in what they support people with. Um, and it's not even based in Lancashire. The first project was called Curry's Count, which is an advocacy service supporting people who care for other people. Um, and then from that, there was like so there was a contract that went out for like a peer mental health support um, network, and Cloverleaf got that as well. So I'm just going to read like a really short synopsis of it because otherwise I'll waffle for too long about it. Right? But they were commissioned by Lancashire County Council to help co-develop, and that's the most important thing here. It wasn't like a, you set this up so that people can access it. This was okay. We get the people that are interested and then we'll set it together. So I co develop a peer and group advocacy network throughout Lancashire with a core team of four people who all have lived experience of various mental health issues. Part of this project is to help launch Lancashire Mental Health Partnership that will function akin to the existing Autism Partnership Board and the Learning Disability Board. So basically, once that was formed, we had to decide how we was going to kind of uh, meet up and in what format. So the first meeting happened and then it was kind of decided by all in attendance and then the people that we had conversations with previously that meetings wouldn't really be um, the most functional way for, to have everybody involved because um, it's all about accessibility. So we, we came up with like, we asked people how they would like to be involved and the, the the kind of a lot of the feedback was phone calls in their own time um, a lot of the feedback was emails and social media as well and a podcast was another way as well which we're currently having talks with but nothing, nothing's been set up with that yet um, and it was like bottom of the list in terms of the actual meeting and Lancashire County Council and the commissioners were kind of like you know why, why is that the case? And, and the response back was really, it seemed too formal, it seemed too like regimented, and people wanted to share when they wanted to share. So collectively we came up with these subgroups, there's just six to start with. So there's, um, it was holistic pathways, but that transcended into different ways to wellbeing. That was a better wording for, for the people that mentioned it. So it was like, all right, we can, we can roll with that. We're not, we're not um, restrictive around names or anything like that. Um, so we've got different ways to well-being. We've got the zines. So obviously I'm very interested in this event with what's going on here. Um, we've got housing and benefits. Um, we've got employment. And we've also got uh, education. But we've also got uh, self-advocacy awareness packs. And what that really is, is certain services like uh, social prescribing, for instance, it's simplifying that to a point where people can really prepare for what they want to get out of it. Um, just a little bit, of, just a little bit of like um, background before they step into something that might be a bit unknown or where there's a bit of fear or anxiety around. So people inputted into these subgroups, and as they do that, we feed back to the commissioners through these meetings and the idea is to change and shape what's already currently um, in place but also identifying gaps with what's in place and call upon uh, further support funding um, or just outlining it just like I said just identifying it and kind of okay th th there may be a gap here so, for example, in the two subgroups I'm involved in, which is different ways to well-being and the zines, um, obviously there's a lot of evidence upstairs, and I mean all around this building, really, with the impact and the kind of um, freedom that can be provided with a zine, let's say. Um, so we wanted to kind of 
we wanted to kind of put that into practice with our zine so it isn't just like a um, we have to talk about this or we can't say that because someone it's literally whatever's there is there we'll have a conversation around it um, and there's, there's a lot of testimonials from peer advocates in there because obviously they're passionate about sharing their story to, to um, basically put the first foot forward and say look we're all right to talk so hopefully everyone else can can feel like it's a nurturing environment to do so. Um, and then the different ways to well-being. I've already had quite a lot of experience with trying different things. And, uh, you know, like, for example, a flotation tank. Um, so I was already really interested in getting involved in, in that subgroup. And I've uncovered things that obviously I've heard about. Um, but, for instance, a World of Warcraft group and uh, the, the, the stories, the testimonials, the long-lasting stuff that's come from it, it's just it's really powerful and worth a conversation. And what that subgroup is about, really, is developing this, this kind of, uh, not a forum, but some kind of evidence list of what's going on um, to give that back to commissioners and say these are the alternative ways of being what are going on. But what we learn, really, that there's, there's nothing that, there's nothing literally that's out there that can't help somebody. So it's about finding everything in existence, talking to the people what are, uh, you know, like, they might have an idea what doesn't exist. So hearing them out and how that looks and why they think it would be supportive um, for their community or themselves. And, and trying to, um, make it viable for them to make that happen. It's not a case of enabling where it's, um, like I said, there's four people on this project and we're all working part-time. So it's not a case of um, setting all these things up ourselves, but it's a case of, right, back to the commissioners with, this, with, with these requests and basically, you know, what can we do? What can we get close to this? And if we can't, why not? So always coming back with an answer of why we can't and then working to problem solve of why we can't. Um, or why we, if, if, we can, if we can get close to what people are after, let's say. But yeah, that's the biggest thing that I found in that subgroup, that literally anything can help anyone. Like my own story, the, you know, like words, performing, hip hop in general, there's, there's, there's loads of things for me, like, um, you know, getting in the sea. There's, there's just so many different things, being out in, in, in the woods, climbing trees, it's, it, and it's just like this is just one person you know like everyone else shares their different things what they've been up to and, and none of it we, we can have separate conversations about what already exists but none of it is um, better or, or worse or less impactful or more impactful than the other it's just what works so for me that's the feedback at the moment to the commissioners that there's, there's nothing there's literally nothing that can't be considered as mental health and well-being support so yeah, that's, that's that one. And then in terms of if people want to get involved, um, we've got a terms of reference and a code of conduct, which basically just outlines what, it's, it's an agreement with what people make within it. So it's just that you're going to be involved. So whether that is the phone calls, the emails, um, Zoom or, or however that, or turning up on the day to the meetings um, and just being involved in the conversation. We're trying to develop something where people can have easier access to each other's networks and resources because at the moment if i'm sending an email out to to 80 people and it's the same one i have to do it one by one so when somebody comes to me and says can you share about this event it's not really viable to to do it one by one like that so the way we're doing it is that people that are involved if you've got anything to say share if it's about an event if it's about um, uh, a new organisation or something like that, we have zines and that's what it's for. So we'll say the zine's going to go out in six weeks from today, for example. So you have that amount of time to get that information to us and that will guarantee be in the zine. Um, if you wanted to speak at a meeting, obviously the meet, we'll, we'll let people know when the meeting is and there's slots, so there's like an agenda. So there's a bit of time for each subgroup there's also a creative kind of expression. It's like a, 
I did a rap in one of them, well, spoken word type thing, just to kind of uh, lead off and say, this is what anything that anyone's into that helps them, we want to hear about it. So rather than just hearing someone talk about it, let's see what it actually is. You did a rap, didn't you? Yeah. One of the, um, the, first one, yeah. the first one. Yeah. And it was just about our music, you know, as a powerful tool um, in terms of helping me and my well being. So, um, um, and then we've got a photographer in our, uh, in our team as well. To, so the next meeting is actually on Monday, if anyone's interested. So after this, I don't mind exchanging emails. And Where are the meetings? This next one is in Morecambe Library. On Monday? On Monday, yeah, two o'clock. What always happens when I can't be there. Well, <laughs> well, we need to have a chat afterwards and yeah. your availability yeah. and feed that back. Two. two. Yeah. So, like I said, people are definitely invited, but it would be really beneficial for all of us and partners if you read them terms and uh, code of conduct first. Um, Sean, have you mentioned about the online meetings as well? Yes, yeah, people can. Sorry, people can log in via Zoom as sorry. well. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. Honest, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, to anyone that can't make it. So, the idea is the library change so we've we've got on board with all the library services in Lancashire so it, the location changes every three months so the first one we're in Burnley second we're in Skelmersdale and the third one's in Morecambe so we're not like just going from town to town we're kind of here there and everywhere yeah yeah so who knows where the next one will be I couldn't tell you yet I think feedback from partners going forward is um we need more of a uh, uh, a rotor, like a, you know, like a TV guide of when the next one's happening rather than mm-hmm. just rather than six weeks before. Um, but feedback from other partners, and this is where it gets challenging in a partnership, is that they don't like that, to, that, that there's too much planning behind it because they don't know when they can make it uh, nearer to the time. So we're just having them conversations on which way best to work it. But yeah, I hope everyone's got a, an overview of what, what's currently happening, yeah? And then, uh, I'm it's happy. Sure. Yeah, I'm joking, yeah. In the real world, that is. That's it, yeah, we've had, had plenty of zooms, haven't yeah. we? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Anybody want to have any questions or say? Are you all right to answer questions? Yeah, I'll do my best. I'll do my best, yeah. I'm scared to pull water. Well, someone's ready. Alex, yeah? Sure, yeah, sure. I'm really interested, you mentioned uh, the world of work. Yeah. On the uh, computer, you know, computer gaming can be, uh, you know, therapeutic. Can you say a few words on that? It's really interesting. So that wasn't even my research, that. So I was having a conversation with some CVSs. Do you know what CVSs are? Mm-hmm. So it's Community Voluntary well, Service, yeah. yeah. And uh, it's basically social prescribing is what this CVS in particular, uh, like, commission to provide, right? So it's come from the NHS and the, the funding and the contract. And although social prescribing is in place in various clinical um, settings, this is like an alternative social prescribing service. And that was just one of the things that they had like. So I, I don't know in terms of how, how accurate this is, right? Whether the group existed before they came along or whether they just discovered it. but. Whatever happened, it had profound results. So the idea is that the CVSs um, ask these organisations, the CICs and the local groups, do you want to be involved in, uh, be on our, our kind of, uh, uh, it's not a database, but it's, I, I can't, can't think of the word. <laughs> yeah, what's, what's the word? Directory, that's it. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, yeah. So do you want to be on that? Right. So in order for them to be on that, they have to have certain criteria in place, you know, for safeguarding and things like that. This World of Warcraft organisation group was on that, amongst so many others. There's, um, and, and there's been quite a lot of research that's been done at Lancaster University and at UCLan University, probably other universities around the country, um, especially around um, the, the gaming um, uh, uh, world with regards to autism. Um, so it's possible that it's like an offshoot from that because obviously there's mental health issues been. and stuff like that. So. It could have been. Um, but yes, as far as I know, that's going on in like the East Lancashire area. 
Um, so, for example, Alex, this, this would be an example, right? If you were kind of wanting more information on that, and like I said, if you read the terms and wanted to be involved, because it's kind of that two-way thing. It's kind of like, we'll support you if you're going to be involved. Um, because it's, it's really important to kind of get that message across that nothing can happen without everyone else, you know? There's four people that at the core of it, that's it. Um, but the possibilities are massive, you know, because there's so much, there's so much wealth of knowledge and resources and, and funding, which, which is there. It's, so if you said, yeah, I like the sound of that, I want one round here, that's exactly what I'd be saying in a meeting, you know, or you can say it yourself. So that'd be the thing. That'd be an example. Thank you very much. Cool, man. Thank you. So, so just taking on from the, the funding side thing, so I am from Lancaster CBS, those who don't know me, I'm Sharon. Um, uh, this partnership, is it your role to really sort of um, advocate and, and um, push for commissioners to start moving money out towards this towards the kind of health remit rather than the clinical side? Because I absolutely get what you're saying. You know, I, I'm, I'm meeting organisations like you know, the chess club, it doesn't have to be, you know, online game. You know, there's all sorts of board games and chess clubs and all these kind of things that, that are really great. And there's this, I think, particularly in our area, this concept of social describing, money still feels like it sits within the NHS and actually the voluntary sector is doing the work for free. Yeah. And what we need to do is look at how do we push that money out to those organisations on the ground that would benefit. And, and not everything needs to be moved around. It's because some things don't cost a lot money. Mm-hmm. But where it does, how do we how do we influence the money, the commissioners, the people who hold the purse strings to get that money out into communities? Is, is this what this partnership can help? With? Absolutely. So it's literally like okay, this World of Warcraft. Let's say it's helping twenty people currently. It's having a lasting positive outcome. It's clearly reduced. Um, uh, the need, dependency of the world before in other clinical stuff um, might have completely alleviated it or they might still be accessing something else. But it's testimonies. So obviously it's numbers. It's, it's what's that, if it's having an effect, how's it having an effect? So that's why I'm going to certain organisations and trying them out for myself, be, you know, being in that environment. And like I said, we had that chat before about the CVSs that are social prescribing in Hindburn and, and East. Um, they've offered us to test that service out. Now, the idea would be if there's a positive outcome of that, that's a blueprint to take to Lancashire County Council and say, well, if this is being funded by NHS and they are actually taking uh, clients and um, supporting people that are being referred to by Lancashire County Council, then how's that model there's either another service that needs to be coexisting with that or more funding needs to come. One of the issues with that is that, so you know about my project that I project managed the, in my burn, mm-hmm. um, which I'll talk about later, so sorry about that. Uh, so so it, it's depend, the, the people that find out about these, so it is social prescribing really, but it's done on the ground level. Um, I think the, there are problems around the way that these some of these projects get um, publicised, and sometimes it depends upon the type of funding they've got. So the, the project that I project manage in Hindburn, um, the initial funding was specifically for that area, and it was taken on board by a project called Spring Into Action, who are predominantly um, low spunty. And because I was involved with them, I put my side of things on, on onto things, and I'm an autistic adult with ADHD and mental health issues. So, so I was trying to um, encourage them to look at it from another angle. So they've kind of put it out there, but they haven't successfully marketed it to people with mental health, even though they're the people that... I want it to be for everybody. It should be for everybody. It shouldn't be just a little niche. It should be for everybody. Um, but I think there are, there are issues, so we'll have to get together. <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. So it's, um, it's, it's like a long game, you know. Yeah. It's testimonials, it's getting... Uh, yeah, definitely. And then... So, Can I ask a question? Right? Yeah. Um, so I'm a 
course, yeah. Um, Can't see your name, sorry. Julie. Oh, sorry, Julie. Yeah. Um, so I think that one of the, <coughs> the struggles that I kind of face is that I kind of feel that while kind of comparing organisations to include people more and get the funding for that, I also feel that that's kind of quite divisive. Mm-hmm. Like it's my it's segmenting people off a little bit. Like you can access it if you've got mental health problems. So I have mental health problems, but I don't feel that that should be a barrier to me doing my dream, you know, like activities as well, except for the financial implications. Um, I know there used to be something called, I mean, I've not been in Lancaster for long, so I don't know if it existed around here. There was something called self-directed support at one point, whereas, where if I could justify that something was going to be good for my mental health, then the council would pay the fee. So nothing was extortionate. I wasn't going on holidays. I was going to learn French at an institute that could cater for my level of French because just because I have mental health problems doesn't mean to say I'm stupid and not capable of engaging with mainstream activities. And... So I, I kind of, you know, wonder is, well, I completely, like, agree with the basis, you know, that, that you're working from. What what support is there then for people who don't have them? Do you know what I mean? Like, for people who have, like, full-time jobs and that they can pay to do things, whereas I'd be wanting to do them for my mental health. Mm-hmm. But not just have to be keeping into mental health settings, not just having my social life confined to mental health settings. Mm-hmm. Do, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. What capacity is there to support me in being able to actually integrate with the rest of society? There, is, there isn't, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's like there isn't it's any barriers, though, as far as we're concerned. I'm going into places that accept anyone and everyone. Yeah, but I mean, like, where would I... But do you know what I mean? It's like, if you're giving the organisation mm-hmm. funding or whatever to say, well, we've got this interest for yeah. these people who have mental health problems, what about kind of an individual not wanting to go to a setting where it's all about mental health or neurodiversity and actually wanting to integrate with the mainstream. Where does this put? <clears throat> Sorry. Oh, well. Oh, well, yeah. no. no, I'm trying to get what you're saying. Yeah. But like I say, I've been to certain certain places where like this so it is the mental health partnership, right? But it's all about well being as well. So yeah. there is no there's no criteria. If a person thinks they've got lived experience, who am I to say that they have? I think, I think what you're saying is that yeah, so, so a lot of things come from Have I just made everything really obvious? No, no, no. No, no, no. It's asked a question. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the funding situation. Do you know what I mean? Because so, do you mean if to, so instead of a mental health partnership, can there be an uh, everyday working people partnership? Is that what you're talking about? I think she wanted to say that. The people that we get funding from to enable these projects, like I was talking about before, with the Heinberg project. So the local council have decided that they're going to fund a particular project and it's going to be for Medicare. So all the people that go into that, yeah. it's about what, you're, what you would like to see. What I'm is saying is that it, it's, still, it's still kind of your mental health. Yes, yeah, it's so mm-hmm. it's not just, yeah, it's like... Is that kind no, of no, I understand. Sense? I understand. Does, does that make sense? I know there's no easy solution for, and to be honest, it's like it makes that sense. But the way I first got self-directed support, it was kind of like I could do anything with it because yes. actually, it's like people who were accompanying it were yeah. not not very good, but I still think there could be like an awful. I don't know what the last thing it is, does it? I it was a long time ago. Like, it's, down, it's, it's down to personal budgets, I'm afraid. So if, if, if like somebody's got a personal budget, so if they've had a social one and they've got a personal budget, they liaise with the social one and then access it. It's complicated, but do you know what? Yeah. What I mean, it's kind of yeah. it's kind of like it's kind of like a 
it's probably a situation is this way, it's kind of saying, you're a mental health person and we'll support you and the group of the mental health people to do it, but you as an individual to actually do It's quite like mental health. Mm -hmm. That's just a part of you, I think. Yeah, yeah so yeah, can I give you an example? I mean, it's like, and I think it's not just good for me as Mental health, but good work for people to kind of have, have to incorporate somebody with mental health problems into their kind of parameters. Can I give you an example? Yeah. So, sorry, so, so, can, 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 that could be written about in the scene. Oh, yeah. 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 So, and discuss the, the meeting before the meeting. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah, I think we're on to something. I've got yeah. examples where what you're asking is happening. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's what I'm interested in. Right, of, cool. Uh, we'll have a chat after anyway. Sorry, cool. we did. Okay. No, no, that's the time. <laughs> it's brilliant. Thank you. We're trying to have a conversation, and that's what you do, Julia. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then we'll have a discussion. Okay, so my name's Kizzy Bansted and um, I'm involved with, with Joan and Bob and I play with Sean and various people around here. They're quite people, but we all have a lot of links. Um, so I, I mentioned before, I'm an autistic adult um, with ADHD and have other um, medical difficulties, including um, issues with my mental health. Um, and I, I wanted to, to, to first of all say that everybody has mental health and that's mental health that can be good or bad at any point in time and um, mental health doesn't have um, discriminations, it can um, come to anybody at any time regardless of your social status, academic status, whether or not you've got a learning disability or any other thing, it can affect anybody. Um, and I also wanted to say that we live in a society that likes to talk about being very accepting of difference, but actually in reality, it's not very accepting of difference. And um, this affects the mental health too. So I've lived, I'm nearly 59. I've lived all of those years completely masking. I've had to um, really, really struggle to conform because that's what society expects of us. I went to mainstream school. I am what I would say is a cautious learner, so I was always a very bright child, um, but I, I was labelled as a naughty child. So um, I've just explained that I have ADHD and um, I'm autistic. So um, in the 60s, they didn't differentiate in the classroom. They didn't find ways to include all children, um, whether it was in the mainstream school or not. So I went to mainstream school. Um, my teachers would set up a task. I would finish very, very quickly. Um, all my work would be correct. And then I would be basically stimming. So I'd be stimulating myself to, to because I, I needed to. I needed to, do, I needed to stop myself from being bored. So I'd make lots of noises. I would hum. I would whistle. I would sing to myself. And I would also move about a lot and that would be up and down the classroom pacing. Um, and then I would get a primary school, get the ruler, and then at girls' primary school, I got a cane. Um, and that was, I was a, a naughty child because I was disrupting the other children. Um, so I also want to talk about the fact that, um, you know, we do live in a neurodiverse world with lots of differences, and those people that are neurodiverse um, Again, like I've just said, because a lot of us have been trying to um, not stand out as being different, because different is um, uh, frowned upon sometimes. It takes a lot of energy and um, it can affect our mental health. I think I also wanted to say about giving ourselves permission to be different. So it's taken me a long time to get to that point. Um, but now I give myself permission to be different. So I don't care now if I'm ticking, if I'm um, moving about, like if I'm rambling, if I'm um, stammering, or doing any of those things that used to worry me when I was, was younger. 
um, I give my myself permission to do that. And I uh, used to have in my house, I don't know if anybody else knows this, but we used to have um, a safe space. It is a, a physical um, piece of apparatus, which is cushioned um, and it, it's like a big tent, but it's more stable than a big tent. Um, and we used to have one in our house, but it took a, a whole room because it was massive. So um, I have since decided to go back to my childhood and create dens. So during the first year of COVID, I put a great big bell tent in my garden and decorated it with lots of nice things like fabric and bunting and lights and cushions and things that smelled nice. I had a wood burner in there. Um, I could cook out there if I wanted to. I could have um, my drinks out there. I could study out there, work out there, whatever. Um, and that was my sanctuary. Um, and so I'd really like to tell people, you know, give yourself permission and if you need to give yourself a bit of space and whether that, whatever that space looks like for you, then please do be kind to yourself and allow yourself to have that space. And then I just wanted to, again, carry on from what Sean was just saying earlier. Um, I'm sure a lot of us already know about the five ways to well-being, but I have to create myself a little word to remind myself. So I have, I, I, I make myself a little up and in. The word is clang. I'm, I'm a clangless fan, so I don't know whether anybody out there knows clangless, but I'm a clangless fan. So clang stands for C for community, which is kind of what we're doing here now, um, but there are lots of different communities. That might be your family, it might be a friendship group of your friends, um, it might be a group that you attend, um, it might be a French group that you, you go to. It might be something that we hang out together and do. Um, so that's community. And then L is for learning. I like to learn something new every day. Um, I am completely addicted to collecting degrees, and I many of them. <laughs> I just started another MSc at the beginning of this week, which I'm doing distance learning. Um, but I learn from people every single day and I take that on board and I really make a point of telling people, thank you, you've just taught me something new. And I, and I look around my environment for things to learn and that really helps your brain. The next one is A for activity. So activity is not just the physical activity that lots of people think, right, we've got to be active. It's about keeping our brain active too. And that might be that we... Um, do crosswords or we play games or, you know, we do crafts or things that aren't actually running about and jumping up and down as much as white likes to do those things. And then N is for taking notice. I love forest bathing. I love slowing things down because I'm, my mind races completely um, on a bonkers level um, and I get really manic. So I like to slow things down and I do that by going for a nice walk in the woods and taking on board all of the sensory things that we, we uh, can become aware of. So that's what we can smell, that's what we can hear, it's what we can see, it's what we can taste. I like, I like licking things, I like going up to um, bark and finding things and tasting them that I know are okay for me, by the way. Um, and any part of our sensory system, we can slow ourselves down by taking notice with those. And then the last one, I think people forget about this one and it fits in with what the Tara said to do very much. And it's about giving. And, and so I, I really like to do my demands of kindness to people. Like one of my strap lines is, if, I, if you get an email from me, you'll know it says passionate about kindness. And that's what it says at the end. And I genuinely like to be kind. It makes me feel really happy. Um, so when I'm well, I try and be as kind as I can to other people. Um, we don't have to spend lots of money to, be, to give to other people. We can just give a little bit of our time and ourselves. We can swap skills with each other. Um, we can offer workshops, which just reminds me now that the, the last thing that I was going to say was about um, a project that I manage in Pineburn, which is what we were talking about before. 
So that project has brought together um, mindfulness and well-being and craft and art, and that's those things combined. So it is social prescription, but again, it's it's um, been put out there due to some funding that was available. I'm hoping that I will get some funding to be able to deliver that around the whole of Lancashire rather than just one small area. Um, I'm in talks at the moment with the Autism Partnership Board and Dan, don't know if you know about that, um, to try and deliver something in, in Lancaster. So we're in talks about that at the moment. Um, and it won't be exclusive, by the way, so it will be for anybody to, to come. So the group that I set up in um, Heimburn, I, I struggle with suicidal ideation, so I'm sorry if I upset anybody by saying that. Um, and what I do to keep myself strong and healthy is that all of these things that I've just mentioned to you, um, when I got the funding for the project that I managed in Heimburn, I was so overly excited. Um, unfortunately, it then um, coincided with uh, my friend taking his own life. So to keep myself positive, um, we named the group with everybody else's permission, um, Fat Nanny, which stands for for all the meals, so my family was called Neil and Nels and everyone else. So in other words, that's for every male, every female, anybody, whoever you are, however you want to um, describe yourself, whatever your gender identity is, whatever your sexual identity is, whatever your neurodiversity is, it is completely inclusive. So, um, it's going to me. I hope I've only been sure. Any questions? I just said thank you. Yeah. 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 Now, I've, I've got a question. I'm really interested in this. Let me keep learning within the therapeutic context. Yeah. That really rings my bell. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd like to hear, hear more about, yeah. You know, how you were using learning? Yeah, so, I, so within within so so I I need to learn. My brain is so active; it's, it is uh, it, it does my own head in. Never mind other people's head. So so I so I, I need to juggle lots of things at the same time. So otherwise, I get uh, bored, and then my brain starts doing other things. So um, I'm actually in the back. Well, I we're, we're on hold at the moment. I'm actually in the band with Bob who's just walked out and another guy. Um, and I play a lot of music instruments as well as sing. Um, so that's one thing that I do. And um, I'll go along and attend various different things and listen to people and thank them for, for you know, the opportunity to hear them. And I usually watch people quite closely, so I'll, I'll um, think, actually quite like the way they're doing that. I'll go over and ask them that because that's another aspect of my learning. Um, I don't think I've ever been out of education, actually. I think I've continued in education most of my life. I think I probably had a year off when I was pregnant. No, two years off, actually. I've got two children, so probably two years off. But other than that, with regards to degrees, that is, um, that academic sort of learning. But um, like I said before, I like to actively learn so I like to look for things to, to learn about and I like to thank people for, for what they've um, taught me because I think that's good for their mental health and I think that's really good for my mental health to actually thank someone for something. Thank you. Yeah. This is, it's not really a question, so I'm just like, it's like a remark that um, what I really like about what you've just said is that um, kind of I have had five ways to well being pushed on my so many times. Um, it after a while it's really depressing. It's like you're not well because you're not doing these things in this very like why what is it like you said you can ways and well it we might touch on those but it it's like being feel quite prescriptive, you know, with you're being very descriptive. As opposed to, if you're not doing these five ways, you're going to be on the until you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm afraid of these slaves, you know, I really like that. It's more of a comment. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Does anybody else want to ask anything? <coughs> sure. oh, well, yeah, I, I, I think if you lack strategy, <laughs> all of a sudden something comes up with a strategy, um, and if we're not doing that strategy, then it's not the right and, thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's starting to work for one person, it doesn't work for everybody, you know, and it really doesn't. So, the, so I've learned in my nearly 59 years the strategies that work for me. It's taken me a long time. I've worked out what my triggers are to getting in, and that's it. I only, I only really started to work out what my triggers were the last time I was in crisis. Um, that's it's taken so long, so, so much therapy, so it's such a long, long time to get to that place. But now I know those are the triggers, so I have to have uh, things in place. One thing, another thing that works for me is I have a one-page profile that I share with. Um, my social worker and with the people that have to work with me um, to make sure that I'm kept safe and to make sure that the people that work with me know when to worry and when not to worry. Um, so that's, that's, that's a, a helpful strategy for me. I'm not going to say, you must do this and you must do that. And I think that's really important for people out there, especially in the, in the, the medical world, Things that like medical model that can become very prescriptive. It's like if you're not doing these five things that you know you should be, it's your fault that you're not. Mm. Even if one of them is really triggering for you, mm. or something like, well, you're not doing it. Yeah. So now it sounds like a, a great approach that you've got. The one of the things that I, I, I just wanted to add into the conversation is that um, the lack of trauma support or the lack of awareness around trauma and lying in lots of um, issues. And also this, I kind of was, what you were saying earlier about services and organisations, it's almost like um, we know that there's stigma and blah, 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 blah. We know that. But there's almost a separation between people who've got mental health problems and people who have got mental health problems. Even though we know that every is a thing that is part of humanity. You know, Buddhist uh, land is about suffering. Why? I mean, it's not. It's not just a It's just part of the human condition. Yeah, you're absolutely right about this. We suffer. Yeah. We, we, you know, we, we grieve. People die. We get upset. People are born. We get upset. <laughs> you know, um, for all kinds of human reasons, we have crises. Mm-hmm. Um, some of us are more supported. Some of us are less supported. Mm-hmm. Some of us have more resources. Than yeah. But we live in a traumatising world. And I think one of the problems is that we, in this country anyway, we individualise everything. We individualise. When, when someone has a mental health issue, we say it's you. But actually, they're part of... A lot of the things are external, aren't they? They're not part, the part of the system. We are mm-hmm. oppressive people. And so many different yeah, levels. absolutely. And, um, you know, racism, poverty. These are all traumatised conditions. To so actually walk past somebody who's lying in next to a bin, yeah. sleeping, age 17, that's traumatising. That, it kills a part of our heart. And um, it's not okay for any woman to know that two girls there and those children are starving. It's not okay. Can I just make a little a short response to that about the trauma, the trauma side of things? So I, I do a lot of work with the NHS and, and also with the justice system. And um, the justice system are actually taking on board this trauma side of things. They're trying really, really hard um, to, to, to think about things from that perspective, first of all, before they start working with people. So there are move, there are move steps. There are steps forward. But... Yeah, we still, in this country anyway, are still living in a society where um, people are being traumatised every day on different levels and uh, where that's not factored in. So, so I'm going to say also, uh, what, sorry, I've been saying, what I've been saying. So, and to help people um, doesn't necessarily require rocket science. You know, we know that actually witnessing people being um, accepting people being there in my presence, just during COVID, what do you do, for example? She just, she just turned up once a week for a hand. There's a film upstairs that shows you that people said it saved my life. 
I would drink, I wouldn't do anything. She just turned up in the woods, that's, you know, we used to live this far away. And people said the same way that. Um, so it's almost like, and, and this thing about people having mental health is not services for mental health is, I feel like everyone should open everything to everyone. And you happen to be in recovery, you happen to have mental health issues, you happen to have cancer, you happen to have been to prison, you happen to have been section, you happen to not. And people, it's, it's, it's just like, so I'm saying about what you said about it, that's everyone. It feels like all of us need to consider mental health issues. Mm. All of us need to consider all of these issues and make an extra special effort to open our doors and be inclusive. Um, I absolutely agree, and I think, you know, like we've, we've, we've both said, that society uh, pushes upon us certain ways of, of being, or some of us, not all of us, but um, it certainly pushes out there in, in um, the media, et cetera, how we should be behaving or how we should not be behaving. And I think that, that example that you gave earlier about somebody lying next to a bin asleep um, without anywhere to live, I think, you know, there's been... A, a societal response to that that's pushed it out there onto other people so therefore people just look with disdain um, so in the end the people that care about those kind of people are in the minority and it should be everybody's responsibility you know and that's across the border don't just be about people who are living in that way whether it's drug abuse alcohol abuse whatever it is you know we, we, we're conditioned in, so I can't talk about living in other countries but certainly in this country we're conditioned to behave and respond to, to, to other people in a quite a, what I feel is a, a negative, unhelpful, unkind way. Yeah. Yeah. I just agree with so much with what Eldan has said, because everything to do with any kind of illness seems to be couched in such lowly terms of personal fairness. Uh, I just lost my sister. Uh, and so many people can't, she was happy now for quite a while, uh, with cancer. And so many people, and I see it all the time when they say, she's lost her back for you know, cancer. Oh, it's the language. It's the language of, yeah. of battle, battle of challenge. Mm -hmm. And if you die or have become severely um, derailed mentally, then it's because you haven't had the will of power and strength to fight. Yeah. Mm. The, the and language. you can't stand this kind of thing where uh, you know, she fought so hard. Mm. Uh, and then, of course, she just came in and died. Yeah. I mean, I find it We've just been talking about that whole language um, thing upstairs, actually. Yeah. The language um, around the business and how we respond to it. Uh, it's like anything else, really, in the spot, isn't it? If you're not out there, you know, with fists up, making your way, then you have given in and you've sort of been up with that struggle and you're failing. Yeah. Uh, I find it completely boring and very, very difficult to That kind of language actually ends up being part of everybody's nature because it's kind of put out there and it, you know you have to think really you have to be really strong within you, your own uh mind to be able to to put things in a different way yes. you know we I, I was giving an example upstairs actually about a conversation that was involved in and it's it's about other self some of the south Africa. um it was about other south advocates and myself being involved in um a project um around people um coming out of um, secure institutions um, on discharge and working with them as peer, as, you know, peer support. And not everybody has the skills to be able to do that, but some of us are so eager, we want to offer to do everything. And I, I wanted to say that in a kind way, but to ensure that other people that I was there talking to would take this on board. And I didn't want them to think I was attacking them again, attacking um, so, so I said, I tried to put myself on the spot. So I said, you know, we're all eager to do all of these things, even though we might not have the right skills to do them. And I'm probably the biggest culprit of all. That's the language that I used. I didn't even think. And then somebody else that was in the group who is a psychiatrist actually said, 
kissing, that language, you shouldn't be using it, it's very negative about yourself. And, and I just, it was such a shock to myself that I was using that language that I just absolutely broke down and burst into tears. Um, and it's true, you know, I tried really hard to use positive language, but I fall prey to it, fall prey to it as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I've always really enjoyed your level of self knowledge. Um, oh, you. you really know who you are. <laughs> And, uh, well, I know I'm very outspoken. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a there's a there's a great joy about the, your self knowledge, and it and it opens up pathways for us all to follow that. And Thank I you. think and self love is a, a radical act it in is. an oppressive world. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to talk, because this event's all about reimagining mental health. And uh, one of the projects on this wall, I think, possibly, the Icarus Project, which was a project in the States, now called the Fireweed Collective, came up with this idea of madness as a dangerous gift. And that's something that's touched a lot of people in relation to how they might experience their madness and distress. So Dina wants to talk about um, her experience of that and how it's helped her um, with your own experiences. So Dina's going to talk about five to ten minutes and then we're going to have a conversation about the idea of madness as a dangerous gift. So over to you, Dina. Thank hello. you. Um, yes, hello. Uh, yeah, I think um, I find uh, the idea of madness as a dangerous gift as, um, yeah. as one of the best uh, descriptions of madness um, because I think it kind of captures the contradiction and also the ambivalent, my ambivalence around my madness and madness as a whole. I think I can find more to talk about the dangerous aspect rather than the gift. I guess for me, well, the dangerous aspect was, you know, my experience of what it was called psychotic depression and how terrifying it was, how, uh, you know, for me and for people around me. I mean, Helen uh, saw me when I was like that, so I was very difficult to be with. I, uh, I wasn't violent. I guess I was violent against myself in the sense that I was suicidal. But... Um, I was very tonic, very uh, not being able to think. I couldn't understand English. I had written a PhD in English, but I couldn't understand the language when I was in that space. And uh, also, you know, my experience of being sectioned uh, for three months in North Manchester Hospital, I think it was a very particularly traumatic experience. Because for me, there was no therapeutic care whatsoever. Uh, Sorry to interrupt you, when, how long ago was this? Oh, yeah, oh. Uh, it was 2009. Uh, it's just to put it into perspective about the care. Of oh, course. Well, it hasn't changed much. It's <laughs> family, but uh, yeah, it was 2009. So I was there for three months. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I mean, according to my care coordinator afterwards, you know, the hospitalisation didn't do much. Uh, perhaps, you know, I was able to sleep better as a result of the drugs, perhaps. I'm not sure what it did for me. It did traumatise me. And um, I was watching, I don't know how many of you watched the Dispatches programme, um, where basically they were talking about uh, a lot of um, suicides of people who um, either absconded 
on from psychiatric wards or they, they, they had to leave, but they never got back. I mean, I absconded twice. So in a way, it's a kind of miracle that I'm here because the first time, I don't recollect. I don't remember that. So I was drugged up and uh, no sense of orientation. So I don't know how I managed to get from North Manchester to south to the south of Manchester. Walk. Use means of transport. I don't know. I don't know. And that's really scary. The same thing happened to me. And of course, you know, that raises issues to do because those days, the, war, the, 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 the doors were not locked, which is a good thing. But the thing is, I was able to open the door and go. So, you know, what that means, there was no safety whatsoever. Because, I, I mean, I think they, they, a, they needed to be aware that I was leaving in such a state. And even they could have tried to stop me. In, in a kind of safe way. I mean, yeah, that raises a lot of issues mm. to do with compulsion. Mm. So, um, so that's the danger aspect. And I guess the gift for me was that that was my second experience of crisis. The first, my first crisis was when I came to England first time to do a master's degree in 1990. And I had my first experience of clinical depression. And as a result, I went into therapy. That's the gift, in the sense that I had to go into therapy. Well, the gift also is that I was able to pay for that therapy because it wasn't provided uh, freely. And uh, luckily, I had a good scholarship from Greece, so a lot of the money was going towards the therapy. So that's the gift. Um, and I, uh, I was looking at uh, something that um, Spike Milligan uh, said. Who, Spike Milligan was an Irish writer, uh, and um, what else was he? He was a writer, Spike, wasn't he? As a comedian, he was, a, comedian. He was a, an actor. He was an actor as well. He was also someone who struggled with his mental health. Yes, exactly. And uh, so he said. Blessed are the cracked, for they let in the light. And that, I think, captures the contradictions. Because, I mean, we crack when we have a crisis. But somehow, I think, another gift is that I think it kind of opens up our understanding of the human condition when we go into these places. The, you know, the, the kind of extreme states or whatever you want to call them. And also, um, and I think that's a really... What's the lady that made that? I can't see her from here, but I didn't do that. I didn't draw that, but that's a good image of the cracks. And also, Leonard Cohen uh, wrote a song, and uh, I'm just going to read some of it. And then we'll just have a discussion. So he says, The birds they sank at the break of day start again. I heard them say, Don't dwell on what has passed away or what is yet to be. Or the wars they will be fought again. The holy dove, she will be caught again. The dove is never free. Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. And it goes on. It's, it's, a, long, it's a long song. And we're going to put up... Can you put them up there? Yeah. yeah, the lyrics. It goes on, so I don't want to... You know, I think it's a beautiful... I wanted to play the song, but then we decided that my both I, You know, we didn't have the speakers of that. Yeah, so I guess... Yeah, I guess for me, um, you know, madness as a dangerous gift is, is a, a useful way for me to understand what happened to me and see some benefits of having broken down. And there is this obvious stuff about it's not a breakdown, it's a breakthrough. Well, 
and there's very strongly stuff about post traumatic growth. Um, yeah. But when you're in it, you don't see any growth. Yeah, I'll stop here. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say thank you, what you've just shared. And also, I wanted to say that I love those two pieces that you've just shared. Do you, have you heard of, I might get this wrong, so I do apologise if I've got the wrong word, but there's a Japanese culture. Um, I think it's Fujitsu or something like that. Fujitsu, Sumi or something like that. And it's um, where they repair the broken things and make them a thing of beauty. Mm, yeah. So, um, and they'll, so they'll, a, cra- a broken vase. What did, did someone remember the name? Wabi Sabi. What's it called? Wabi Sabi. I think it's cook. Co- I think, we're, we're I think it's called what you said. Kintsuki. Kintsuki. Yeah, so, so um, for example, there might be a broken vase that's broken into many pieces, and they don't want to just see that as something that's broken and finished. They want to see that as a piece of beauty, so they build it back together with gold. Mm-hmm. And so it, this is me just commenting on what you just said, so I think the whole thing about being enlightened sometimes... We've had a similar experience in going into um, um, secure units, sorry. Mm. Um, I think to be able to see a different side of that madness is a good thing to, even though it's difficult, it's, it, it's good to be able to see through those maps and see some good things too. Yeah. Actually, some wonderful, you know, uh, Spike Milligan is an example of it. Some wonderful thing comes out. Some wonderful things come out of madness. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, you know, all the art. I mean, most of the art. So, the writers were totally on the Do you want to ask like to ask a question or say something in response? Bob. I, I love that song. Uh, yeah. Look to me. Sorry, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> would you like to? No, that would be Yeah. Oh, 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 it was a whole whole thing of Doctor Who. Um. Oh. Oh. It was like that. I think. I think. I'm not really sorry. I think. I think for me, what it kind of conjures up, and I think one of the reasons I like it as well is that. It's kind of like, yes, the, the, the double edge, the paradox of it, in that it might let the light in, but people in the meantime will suffer and we will lose people. Mm-hmm. You know, if you crack open, you might recover, you might not. Um, and there's something what I like about it that gets against the romanticization of madness that yeah. we can sometimes get into. Either it's demonised as dangerous and we must prevent people going mad, or that it's somehow it's a spiritual journey and or you know we will learn things from it if we just rec- and there's something that it's bit, problematic yeah. in that. And it's, I think what really it does tricky. is that it's it, really tricky, isn't it, when you're in the midst of it and you've been through it yourself to see anything other than oh my god, this is just awful. I never want to be there again. Mm-hmm. And especially if you've been through it. I mean, the idea of dangerous gift, I think, is is that it came from the by from the experience of people who who experienced bipolar. It's Jack Mac- McNamara. Yeah, okay. that's right. Wrote about yeah, his bipolar bipolar experience, and also, if I say something in relation to that, there is uh, people have written about um, the paradox in you know survivor knowledge, experience knowledge as having uh, pride and shame. Mm-hmm. So, you know, mm-hmm. it's it, it, the shame attached to that mm-hmm. knowledge because of some of the experience we I had and not uh, pr- proud about. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, hopefully, a sense of pride for being here today. Mm-hmm. So, you know, but again, that's part of the shame. Yeah, sorry. I just have a question about before. when you were in that, or going a few services or even now, and I didn't know what the source of the mirror actually, I just turned up. <laughs> I, 
but men were called by more with double edged sword as studying to mm-hmm. explore the positive side. And the people I interviewed, and I couldn't be one, I've been from my also, all said, Well, yes, but both. You know, like what you talked about. You're not really allowed to talk about positive and services, and if you do, you see as having no insight or, you know, a delusion. Of grandiose. Yeah. <laughs> What's that sort of delusions of grandiose. Yeah. But all that I know from my own team, like obviously it's very personal. There's definite benefits for me for Bywaller, and only fifty percent of people who meet the criteria end up in services. So what about the other fifty percent? What can we learn from them? And my question is, you know, do you find room for talking about positives when you engage with professional services? Yeah. Sorry, it's way too Is it possible to shut that door? Because I'm getting really distracted. I can't hear. Personally, I, I didn't have bipolar. So my whole experience was about in the depths of my shit. So I don't have that. Uh, my only experience of being manic is when I try to come off and vaccine and you get that um, um, false sense of euphoria. But for me, it's false. I'm not, I'm not happy, but I just that, you know, I can conquer the world. I'm not saying this is like bipolar, but I don't have experience of that side. You do get a very, very big mania from coming off the vaccine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I don't think this is the kind of thing you're talking about. Well, it doesn't necessarily support my novels. It's something some people might say that depression has benefits, you know, because it gives you insight it can apply to all, not just bipolar. Well, yeah, I mean, for me, the benefit was that, you know, I had to uh, face uh, intergener- my intergenerational trauma and, and I went into therapy. That was the gift. But without the therapy, I can't see any gift. I can't see any, any positive. But I'm not saying this is the experience of everyone. There was a really interesting article in Asylum a few years ago. I don't know if it's in one of those issues about someone writing about their experience of depression and how they felt alienated from the mad pride discourse. Because, and I think that's what you're speaking to in a way, isn't it? That I think a lot of people who are involved in the mad pride movement had experiences of bipolar. I think a lot of the initiators of that movement because there was more of a reclaiming, of, of a, a need to reclaim pride from that experience. But I think in depression, I think it's something quite different in relation to that, isn't it? I think that experience so it's quite interesting that you do resonate with that idea even though it was primarily depression and psychotic depression that you experienced rather than bipolar kind of yeah. experiences but yeah just one way to comment about um i suppose because language and where we understand it, it just didn't piss it does great a little bit <clears throat> and that we have to talk in the terms that we are by using um, the medical jargon, the, you know, the, and I, I really recognise that people sometimes want labels like, and it helps and all that. But I was kind of just, to reimagine, um, it would be uplifting if we could to reclaim some, or not re, it isn't about reclaiming, it's actually about creatively thinking of, new ways to describe. Um, uh, so do you think dangerous gift is that or not? Do you think it's well, not? I'm that's, at all. Yeah. I'm really sorry about that's what the dang- that's what the idea of the dangerous gift is supposed to be. But I you also think? just to move on from that, I think you've already said that, um, uh, and I'm not sure how, because you need a collective uh, awareness and agreement and nobody agrees on Terminology, you know, one like even lived experience isn't good enough for some people or whatever. So it kind of doesn't matter on one level. So maybe we should just accept terms. But I also think that as someone who is an ex or having, I've been through all those, really all of them, all the main ones. So it's kind of like, well, which bit, what, where do you, what, who, you, which bit were you talking about? But I really, um, love your writing about the liminal space, and I wondered if you'd mention that because I, that, I think that's no, what, uh, I, 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 I mean, a piece. 
Yeah, I guess, you know, this, uh, this kind of idea, it's, it's a limit. I mean, you know, it, um, madness is a limit on space where if you think that it's both, both and neither nor, that's the idea of liminal space, isn't it? So if it's both dangerous and a gift, but neither these things alone, then that's, that's a liminal space, yeah. isn't it? And did you mention that? No, I didn't, no, because I, 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 only, I could only speak for five minutes, <laughs> you know. But also... You could say the liminality and madness. If madness is a threshold to something, like some people think, an opening, a, tra- a transitional space into something. Yeah. Um, and I guess even, even though I am a bit, I'm quite cynical towards the, you know, stuff about post growth. I mean, yeah, I think he has given me uh, a better, uh, well, a different understanding of humanity. Although, to be honest, I wish I had met all of you at the gym. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not here. Do you go to the gym? Why the gym? <laughs> well, not, well, not in the medical <laughs> world, which is actually shows my ambivalence to... Yeah, embrace your madness and be proud. Well, there are not many things to be proud about this experience. But the thing you're saying about like post-traumatic growth, and it's like you can grow without trauma. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that would be the idea. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a, it's a service this language. This isn't it. This is the post-traumatic yeah. growth. It's like, oh yeah, yeah. it's uh, as the recovery business and all that. So. So we had one of the tables where we asked people to reflect on, you know, whether they'd found, you know, phrases or metaphors or images that they found more helpful to them. Um, Dangerous Gift was the one that we came up with because it has resonated with a lot of people. Um, I don't know if people wanted to share any others like that. Yeah. We've said that about terminology, and I just used bipolar then. When I submitted that paper to public for publication, I used extreme mood, mm. extreme, extreme mm. mood, mm. and uh, I felt really strongly about not using the term mm. bipolar disorder. Mm. I used yeah. to say that it's disorder, it's yeah. part of humanity, and no. Anyway, the journal, the, the journal said, well, I'll publish it if you use bipolar disorder. Mm. Exactly. So I fell out with my supervisor, going, no, let's not publish it there, and, but in the end, it was either publish it in a really great journal with my voice on it, or publish it in a journal that isn't going to be read as much. And I was like, oh, we're going to have to play the game to be yeah. in the game. And it, it really was like, I think it's so want to use that term. You have the same with, so um, autism is sometimes known as ASD, which is autism yeah. spectrum disorder. Mm-hmm. I'm not disordered, that's just the way my brain's wired. It's just a different way that my brain is wired mm-hmm. to, to somebody yeah. else. Yeah. Um, and the whole thing about the spectrum, the way that people talk about the spectrum, it's like this linear line where you're more or you're less. That's a load of baloney. For a start off, you're not more or less than the I'm not. One of the other ways that they, they like to label people is have, or rather have done, is high or low functioning. Mm. And they, they look at me and they say, I was high functioning. I don't want to be seen as, as better than somebody else or less than somebody else. I'm just myself. And I, I can be either more or less, um, I don't know, I might have more or less issues with regards to executive functioning or whatever else it is in one hour or one day. So it's not, it's more like some kind of sort of global thing rather than, so, you know, hmm. what you call it, not globe. Spherical. Spherical. Okay. I like a spherical thing, not a linear thing. And I think this, this language is really unhelpful. Yeah. It's really unhelpful. Somebody, yeah, wanted to say something. Um, language around diversity, which is obviously is like is meant to be res- like a um, resisting pathological frameworks. So it comes from a community. It's not. It wasn't medically constructed. Mm-hmm. It's now being taken back and appropriated within a kind of um, pathology paradigm. So you'll see people using the word neurodiversity when actually 
it's business as usual. So, mm. in a way, this is a little fun one, like it's like the most beautiful. Yeah. I mean, this is why somebody's called it very monotropism, and I think it's a lot of people don't actually understand it, they can't appropriate it. So, yeah. what was something they can't monotropism? It's a way of describing people who have single focus, um, which is also, it was. Yeah, if you're Greek, you understand it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's interesting how these things work. Language is so powerful that you want to be able to go back to a different... I, 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 although I do agree with this about language, sorry to um, cut in there, I, I actually think this is about where who's got the power. It's actually about power because... All all of those con, sort of constructs around or whatever you call it. I don't know if I'm using my terminology here. Yeah. Those sort of construct, um, but they lead back to the power that people like the drug companies have. Mm-hmm. I mean, massively powerful around all these words and models and linear or <laughs> pathways. Mm-hmm. And, and I, so, although it is about language, it, it really is much, much, much more. So we can fart us around around, uh, you know, discussing how language can, can restrain us and whatever. But actually, it is the, the power behind that, those terms, I think. Hmm. But, there was uh, somebody chair. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Fine. Spoke over you. This is just a slightly different point related to the thing that you've been talking about before. Just this idea of a dangerous gift, to me, it makes it sound like some people have it and some people don't. Whereas I think when I think of mental health and people who really experience difficulties doing their mental health, there are obviously some people who have many more difficulties than other people. It's just this idea that actually I think all of us can understand what it is like to not have great mental health all the time. I like, think it was kind of unusual if someone's like, no, no, I don't have any mental health issues whatsoever. And, you know, of course you are going to be brain stress. So I think that kind of concept to me of it being this gift makes it sound like only some people have this rather than actually we all have elements of similar and uh, different mental health uh, issues at different times, even if, like you were just saying, in your start thing, obviously for you, that has been extremely difficult for you at times. I mean, you know, everybody has that sort of experience to be able to connect with, but also has great, great stress and uh, troubling on the edge of. Um, yeah. 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 Uh, I think... Yeah, I think we all may go through experiences of difficulty, but I think there is a qualitative difference between stress and these extreme experiences of distress where you don't be alive, for example. Um, So, yeah, I agree. And I think this idea of dangerous gift is probably another way to reclaim madness as a something that is not totally negative. So, yeah, possibly you, yeah, it may sound that some people have it and some people don't, but for me, I think that the gift was going into therapy. For other people, maybe the gift is that they were able to write great poetry when they were in a psychotic state. I don't know. So, for, and, and madness for me, you know, the, the kind of extremes are very different from experiencing, you know, some stressful situations. And this idea that we all have our moments of madness is problematic because, yeah, 
Well, no. I mean, there's a qualitative difference between these extreme states and also how, how these states are responding to. There's a very different, you know, losing your liberty, you know, being sectioned. There's a qualitative difference between these experiences to, um, you know, having, you know, some, some stressful situations. So I'm not, I think that's important to, to bear in mind. I think before you said about um, not being able to speak, understand English, even though you've done a PhD, and I, and I know when I have been ill, my brain is in such utter chaos, you cannot function. You cannot function, and that's the difference. I think that's, I won't say that's the definitive difference, but it certainly is a difference to the point where, in the end, you need, it's not that I asked for help, I didn't want any help, but I got it because I would, otherwise I wouldn't be here anymore without doubt. I think as well as drawing that line, because you can say we are all neurodiverse, but there are people who are neuro divergent and people who are neurotypical and sometimes it's important to make that distinction whilst also believing in diversity it's a really difficult balance it to strike is. which is like diversity but also accepting that there are people with different that's experiences and identities that's brilliant which is like sexual diversity yeah we all have sexuality but there's some people who are gay lesbian gay, and those need to be recognized too i think that's the distinction i've kind of made anyway we're up don't want to have the last word but i do so <laughs> 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 Um, yeah, so I'm Helen Spandler. I'm a professor of mental health studies at Preston, live in Manchester. I'm also involved for a long time with Cramp, the Cramp Project. Um, particularly, I edit Asylum magazine, which is over there. And I also... Um, um, involved in the Mad Zines project, which uh, if people have been upstairs and seen all the zines and zine making stuff that's upstairs, you'll um, know what all that's about. So um, I don't really have that much to say. I could talk endlessly about zines and, and Mad Zines, but I really wanted to just kind of be here as a space for us to talk about um, zines. I mean, I've been interested in zines for a long time and they've been around sort of like... I think zines have been in, in uh, as long as people have made stuff with their hands, zines have existed. Um, but they became a thing, I guess. Uh, I first came across them in the sort of 60s and 70s with the anti-psychiatry movement and the mental patients movement, who made kind of handmade booklets and stuff to circulate amongst um, the emerging mental patients movement, as it was called then. Um, and then I got involved in Asylum magazine in the 1980s, which was originally a kind of zine. Now it's more of a magazine. So a zine is like a little hand-produced magazine in, in a way. But they can come in all shapes and sizes um, upstairs, which is what we're kind of doing upstairs. We're trying to experiment with them. But increasingly, in the last sort of 10 years or so, they've, they've had a resurgence. Um, and they've come back, if you like, with a vengeance which is interesting because people, there was a paper written about 20 years ago saying zines are dead because the internet, digital age, thought why would people want to make zines anymore? But actually, far from being dead, they're flourishing. Um, and there's a new sort of movement, if you like, of per zines, where people are writing about making zines about their own personal experiences. Um, and that's how I got more interested in zines because I was very frustrated with the old debates that were going on and on and on, she touched on a lot, really, about the old terminological debates and the medical model versus the social model and all this kind of stuff that was all text-based, going round and round in circles. And it felt to me like more exciting things were happening when people actually could craft their own experiences themselves rather than be constrained by the discourses that, that are arisen either from psychiatry or from anti-psychiatry or from critical psychiatry, or any of these kind of movements, if you like, and people themselves kind of having the autonomy to develop their own language, whether it's text-based language or images or cartoons or collage. Um, and the form of zines themselves are really interesting in relation to how not only they can contain complex experiences, but the form itself allows different kind of experiences to be 
um, portrayed, what's they talked about, but portrayed. So they don't have to be linear. They don't have to be finished. They can be unfinished. They can be seamless. They can be raw. They don't have to be understandable necessarily. Mm -hmm. Whereas a text has to have a like, beginning, middle and end. It has to kind of make sense. And as an academic, I'm often saying to students, you know, like this, you need a clear argument that, that makes sense. And so this project is completely challenging me because I no longer think like that. You know, with a zine, I think it doesn't have to make sense in that way. So we have a different lens to evaluate the zine and to make sense of them. So in the project, and, and Jill at the back there, hello, is working on the project with me, and Tamsin was here, is doing a PhD about, about this project. And we're really sort of trying to be, collect zines and be with them, rather than analysing them, just spending time with them, spending quality time with zines. And in the pandemic, we got a great opportunity to spend quality time with zines because we didn't, couldn't do much else. Um, so what we've got upstairs is, is um, some of the zines that we've been collecting as part of the project that you can have a look at. We've also made zines as part of the project, which we're giving away from the side there. And we've also got a Simon magazine, which is kind of running alongside the zine project as well. So that's kind of all I wanted to say. That I could talk forever ever about this, but I'm just, if anyone's interested in, in having a conversation about zines or asylum or, or possibly want to make a zine or have some zines you want to contribute to the project, then please um, talk to us. Just quickly, did you connect yeah. up with Sean as well? Because he's doing yeah. You know, yes. Yeah. yes, we will. That was why yes, I got him in touch. Yeah. There, there, is, there is a logic to this event. That Jill, the ma that Jill masterminded, and it's got a thread through it. It's got a seam running through it. Um, it's, it's, it's been a weird time, actually, because we all have got, we've all crossed over with, mm. and intermeshed with each other, haven't we, with our other connections, which has been really, really good, and that's mm -hmm. hence why all of you guys are here. Yeah, uh, Dina. I've got a question. Um, I've seen about three before in trying to get my head round why there is this uh, sort of resurgence, do you call it resurgence mm, yeah. of zines? Um, I was thinking um, in the event in Glasgow, this is a zine festival in Glasgow, uh, people were talking at your session about DIY culture, which is what the zines are. Mm. And do you think that this goes together with the fact that, for example, now with mobile phones, People, uh, you know, like make videos with mobile phones so they can make a short film uh, with mobile phones so they can do it themselves. So it doesn't. So is this to do with a, a, a bigger, a broader uh, sense or I don't know if it's a movement or a uh, renewed interest in uh, DIY culture and also does also um, link to perhaps people not having the same kind of trust in formal media, in, in um, formal um, ways of presenting things. Yeah. So they go for a more informal. I think it's all of those things. I think it's also a yearning for connection and a yearning for materiality, for something you can touch and mm. feel. Um, because we're spending so much time on screens. Mm. Um, and I think that we're yearning for a connection. And when you get, when you touch and, and, and be with zines, um, you can have digital zines, but they have a different quality to them. There's something about having some, sending something in the post that someone has made themselves. Yes. You can feel it, you can smell it. It's got a very yeah. different quality yeah. to it. So I think there's all those things too. And I think there is something about it being used by people who feel... So we talk about inclusion a lot. I think we talked about that earlier. And I think more and more people are being included, but there are people who are still excluded. And zines are often made by people who are still excluded. So now you might be able to be gay or lesbian, but it's still hard to be made by bisexual or asexual. So it's not surprising that we now see zines, more zines from people who are asexual, for example, yeah. or trans. 
you know, things that are not as included. And neurodiversity as well, loads of zines about neuro, different forms of neurodiversity, but maybe less zines about experiences that are now more accepted and mainstreamed. So I think it's part of that shift in who's, who's continually outside. So if you think about the LGBT thing, and people often laugh about, oh, how long is the alphabet going to go on for? LGBTQ plus I, ha, 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 and all the rest of it. But the reason that the alphabet exists is because there are people that are still left out. And zines are those people that are still left out of the alphabet. So that's why we're having to add letters to them. And eventually we won't need those anymore. And that would be great, but we're not there yet. So I think zines are part of that, part of the struggle for... Um, I think it's just to be heard and... Yeah, and to have your experience out there. But it does also speak to the fact that you need some level of cultural capital, some level of confidence to feel like you can make a zine and put it out there. Yeah. I think it's interesting that you've linked up the, the tactile side of things and the um, technology because I felt like that about um, Kindle... When the Kindle and, and uh, e-books came in, I was thinking, and the whole thing about no more vinyl records and all all these things that we've lost that actually is so tactile and we want to touch them, we want to smell them. There's, there's actually a culture, I don't know if anybody knows it out there. I can't remember the word for that one either, but these are things that I like to collect. There's a culture um, around uh, of people who like to collect vinyl, uh, vinyl records and smell them. Do you know the <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is. I'm one of them. Okay, but no, there is. There is. A, there is a, a group. There is a movement. And I think there are always going to be social movements. Social movements are always about the next exclusion, if you like. And so, zine. What's interesting about zines is they they're a good window into into that world. Yeah. Um, and it takes individuals maybe to make, or small groups of individuals to make a movement. Yeah. So it starts People off. trying to find their place as well. Like all yeah. these little things that we just talked about now and throughout the whole of the day, they're, they're enabling people to find a place somehow, aren't they? So, you know, we've talked about inclusivity, inclusivity and we've talked about exclusivity. And where one person might not fit into a niche in some way, possibly they might be able to find something somewhere else so a zine or whatever whatever else it is I've got a sweet part of the thing well for the first part would be sort of uh, your, your initial response the zine and zine making have you come to understand it as therapeutic <laughs> That's a, good, oh, that's, a that's, a good, that's a good question. It's whatever word you Yeah, I yeah, know. I think um <laughs> Sorry. No. 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 What, what are the words you, you think? No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it depends what you mean by therapeutic offer. That's a classic academic answer, isn't it? It depends what you mean by how you define it. But I think, I think it's, a, it's a good point because I think it's easy to say it can be therapeutic, but it can be quite traumatic making a zine as well. It can be very, very difficult to make a zine. It can be quite, makes you very vulnerable, makes you, it's quite exposing, um, but then so it's so therapy as well. So I guess I think what worries me about the question in a way is not the question that you've raised. It's more that, so when services get hold of yeah. things, they start to say, and we've seen it already, oh, let's do Z-making workshops in hospital, let's do Z-making workshops. Yeah. yeah, and that might be a great thing, you know, but it, it kind of, there's something then about it being used as though, rather than it being therapeutic, which it may be for some people, but there's a difference between that and it being used as a tool for <laughs> therapy that's then people are made to do sort of thing. But I think, I guess it can... It brings up, I suppose it bring, can bring, if you're doing a per zine, personal experience zine, it's going to bring up a lot of difficult experiences. Well, the second part of my, my, my question, my, the, 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 the stalker. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm interested in, uh, in grief from work done around grief. Uh, and uh, I was interested to find a guy called uh, Ken Doka, who looked at uh, unacknowledged uh, and uh, 
looked at, for example, mm -hmm. in very contact context, like people emotionally, psychologically, and physically suffering because of part of whales has been hunted to extinction in Canada, but they don't live in Canada. But one of the major traumas came from their grief not being acknowledged in the world. It's it, it's excluded from from consideration. Your your expression doesn't feature. Um, uh, so I, I I guess I'm I'm interested in looking around in the world for things that are capable of making complex expressions. Um, yeah. Without a damned industry and professional uh, prompt of managers who editorialize your experience. Um, so that, that sort of... Yeah, I think that's a really good point because I think that I think that zines often, particularly the new, the new type of zines, the modern version, more contemporary zines, are very much about the unacknowledged experiences. Because why make a zine if your experience is already acknowledged everywhere? Why would you need to make a zine about it particularly? There's that urge for recognition that I think zines are in part about. And those, like you say, unacknowledged grief and people were talking about before about like um, intergenerational trauma and stuff that's hidden, stuff that's forbidden, stuff that's um, repressed. Those unacknowledged experiences are, I think, the experiences that, and go back this idea of the crack that lets the light in, those are those unacknowledged experiences. And how do we acknowledge them? This is a task for us all. How do we acknowledge those? If we don't know about them, how can we acknowledge them? How can we see them? How can we recognize each other if we don't know they're there? Uh, and I think zines are one way amongst many of having experiences acknowledged. And therefore, I think it comes from a, a, a profound experience of misrecognition, which I think a lot of madness, distress, neurodiversity mm -hmm. kind of is. It's not feeling recognized, not feeling seen in the world not being seen for who you are. And certainly you know, the neurodivergency is really that. And that's the whole thing about masking. So in a sense, themes are like unmasking. I've got a question about that. Yeah. So I don't, I, 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 so I've read some themes that I got sent mm. to and um, now please forgive me for this language. I'm going to say, are they prescriptive? Good question. So yes, are, so, as in, yeah. are, do they follow a form? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. no. So I'm using that word, yeah. so I do apologise. <laughs> no, yes, yeah, so, well, I think the whole point about these is, is that they shouldn't be prescriptive. But they, they should have the Yes. Yeah. Well, I think what's happening is, is they're becoming institutionalised a bit. So then what happens then is that they, are, they do get prescriptive. So you now see the NHS making zines. And there are zines on five ways to wellbeing. Oh, they're zines on everything. They are, yeah. But they're not what we would consider to be zines. Not, but they are, they call themselves zines, yeah. Things, yeah. So then, I of course, they, they think they're talking about it like a, a mini magazine. Yeah, 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 exactly. Whereas you're talking about a completely different. Exactly, because the whole point of the zine is DIY, handmade. But, so do they, they produce have, it? Do it's they not have an to NHS produced leaflet. Is not a zine. Do they have to have so many pages? It do might they? be good. It might have good information, in it, but yeah. it's not a zine. So do they, Even have, if they call it a zine? Do so they have to have so many pages? Are they double folded? Ah, right. No, yeah, they don't have to be. No, so there's no question. No. Do exactly how you want to do it. No, there's some classic ones like mini zines that are like you know one sheet of A4 and then you, you fold, fold it in a particular way. There's lots of different ways, but there, should, there shouldn't be like this is how a zine. So is. That, most zine workshops have a like let's make a mini zine. Yeah. And that's the thing. Basically, a zine can be made in so, so It can be ways. made in so many different ways that makes complete sense to me because that is about yeah, how you get exactly. this out. And, it, and then it helps the different sort of cognitive styles. So Tamsin upstairs um, that makes zines a lot, and she made one which has a swirly, which made... Oh. So you read it and it swirled around. Oh. But I have this um, BPPV, which means that I read it and I felt sick and had to lie. It made sick and sick and had to So I can't read anything that goes around in my own circles. That's why I've decided that's why I can have but Can't you go like that? You, you don't have to put it like that. Can't you just go? I tried that. And and did. Did. How, are they, how are they circular? How? So they don't understand. What do you mean that they are go round in circles? 
So a zine that is this part, it's like almost like a Mobius strip sort of thing, but not. So it kind of you opened it like up and goes. Oh, like yeah. oh, you haven't part showing all, but yeah. 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 We're Sorry. To, yes. Now we're getting to the time to say. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you to every single person that has come along today. It's been absolutely wonderful to see all of you and hear your your um, stories and the things that you've done today. Um, I, I think it's been amazing and successful. You two, three, or you three, or however many of you. But I, it's been for me to see so many people engaging and, and asking questions about um, what's going on inside our world is, is, is great. But for, for me, I think it's been really amazing and successful. I think I've, I think I've taken the opportunity to do a bit of networking. So <laughs> <laughs> that's been good. So it's kind of free for all to say what you like now, make sure nobody else speaks when you're speaking. Do I have a Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just like that. When you feel inspired, when you are moved to talk. Julie. Um, I think I can't really about speaking over, but I think what's been nice has just been. Um, talking to people and finding common experiences like with different emphases that everybody's um, you know brought to the conversation uh, as well but, so it, it's just been nice to kind of find common ground with people from different backgrounds uh, let's see that's your name thank you Uh, I really like the fact this that what well, it, it I mean it's done is really be a comfortable space. Uh, I, I like the fact that there's so much going on. They can go into so many different. It, it feels like it could easily be a permanent exhibition. Um, but I really like the fact. This is in some way is filtering into what we will reach policy and practice circles because, in some ways, culturally they're hermetically sealed. Uh, and uh, after many years, you know, hammering those doors, you know, I, I sort of gave up. You know, you, your, your fist gets sore, your Throw gets forks and people just look at me and look at it. <laughs> because it's frustrating and it's either, you know, you feel like you're not being heard or, uh, and it feels sometimes hard to say critical things because, particularly after meeting people within professional settings who are wonderful people, lovely people do make a difference as best that they can, even though they're hamstrung by the system they're working in. Um, how do we get uh, past this uh, firewall? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I know I, I eventually found it in pubs. <laughs> People who clock off, hang up the professional guard, mm -hmm. and then can have the safe conversations over a confidential. Perhaps that's an interesting. You know, and, and I, I think this is this is really great moral. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, it speaks to me of a searching. Society, a searching professional society uh, that, that's ha happy to be slightly uncomfortable, slightly out of the comfort zone. Because um, without that, I'm just walking the other way. 
Well, 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 no, no. it's lovely to meet so many other people. Love the cakes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just just in, in terms of, I mean, I, I love the idea of, you know, it could be a more special thing, yeah. I mean, which obviously is unrealistic. But we are going to try and have an online follow-up to today. I think provisionally we said 28th of November. November. Yeah. And um, so that, that certainly... There could be some um, uh, permanency within our website about some of these things and magazines, websites, and what have you. The, um, the other thing to say is that we had hoped that at this stage of the day, um, Cap Smith had agreed to come with everything that's been happening uh, in Westminster. <laughs> 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 I, I want to pass on no, her apologies no, because she was going to be here, but she did apologise that she does need to be elsewhere. Um, but I she, she, will, said it she'll come to but she yeah. will try and join us for um, an online session. So, so that would be a, a good way oh. again. Feedback. Cat Smith is the uh, local MP for Lancaster and Morgan. Morgan, Lancaster, Morgan Fleet. Morgan Fleet. No, sorry, Lancaster Fleet. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there's a not a nice man in Morgan. There's a fracker in Morgan. Fracker? So, can, can we? I, I just was re responding to, to your thing about that. There will be a next stage of this, yeah. Just come in, we're having a kind of sort of general feedback. When the mood takes you, you can speak. Any unfinished business? Can I say something? Yes, Lisa. Not unfinished business. Um, uh, I want to um, thank you all. And um, uh, I learned a lot today. And I'm so grateful for being here. And um, to my research, uh, involves madness, mental health. And then uh, I'm in a very important state, at the very important state. And then I felt that I talked too much. And then uh, upstairs, I just came across a um, uh, scene. And it's about silence. And silence is violence, reasons why silence hurts, some kind of bad thing. And then it helped me that because I was uh, self-criticizing myself, <laughs> and when I see this, okay, I can evaluate things, but I, I mean, it helped me, and um, you helped me, and I shared my story with some of you. And um, other than that, it was for me very impressive to witness how this event is organized, mm. because I'm a PhD student, and I have some sessions that engagement is important, impact is important. And then I was like, oh, how am I going to do this? And how can I engage with people? And what, how this happened? And then I see those notes. And then I saw that notebook. And I put some marks here. And I'm waiting for to see which one is going <laughs> to win. And uh, yeah, there are many ways, like films and um, Hands and um, like what was I mean? I made two zines and uh, met wonderful people, and I even really appreciate the way you put notes on the cookies that the definition like you cared about people, and mm -hmm. I, I can say things sometimes, so I just want my share. <laughs> Can I add to that? that I, I don't think that any of us could expect to uh, co organise an event with Jill without it being special. I'm just going to echo very shortly what you said about care. Like it does, it, it, from the minute I'm sure everyone. 
in this room or maybe I'm making a judgment, but I have always have anxiety before I go anywhere and do something um, and it can be really tightling. And it just, the minute you walked into the building, it just felt, it just felt care and breath and just, yeah, lovely people. So thank you for bringing that. Thank you. Yeah, I also, like, normally I'd stand in the corner. Yeah. And, and like, you went through, I feel drawn to, I might initiate something. But as soon as I came through the door, it was like, you know, just didn't stop, you know? Like, it was Shay first. And then, well, I, I was in, I can't remember, it was on the door, but somebody looked at me and just smiled. And I thought, well, that's a really nice welcome. Yeah. And then I went upstairs. And I was like, not really forthcoming with much, just observe it. And we stuck up a conversation with them. And from there, like, oh, you've got to meet this person. Mm -hmm. And it's it's not just normal talk. It's because I can't do small talk, you know. And it's really interesting stuff. And it's um, conversation worth worth having your voice lost. Do you know what I mean? Worth having your voice lost. It's worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, since you mentioned my name, <laughs> yeah, I've just really, really enjoyed meeting everybody today. It's been so lovely to hear, obviously I'm not so deaf, but different people's stories and experiences and, and the services that you represent as well. I know some people have gone, yeah, it's been, been really enjoyable. Are you Shane? Shane. Oh, Shane. Oh, it's you made all those copies. I'm to say that I came from Berlin this morning, so I bought it in the right yeah. Yeah. Oh, why not? Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, yeah. one rock there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's been lovely. It's been so lovely to be able to, like, say, have this lovely, kind of warm, kind of gracious space for people to come and share. There's no, um, there's, we were upstairs making stuff together, but nobody was teaching anybody else how to do something mm -hmm. because that person didn't know it. It was very much a case of real sit around the table and then create together and see what happens. So it's been a really, really lovely, really, very lovely day. So I'm glad, I'm glad, thank you for inviting me. In fact, I've been invited myself, actually. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. 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 What were you doing for 30 years ago? I was studying here at the University of What year? I was here in 1992. No, no. <laughs> I'm not 30 years ago. This year. is awesome. I'm born in 92. I was having my first midlife crisis in 92. <laughs> Behind it all, everyone's helped out. The real vision of it is good. Yeah. 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 Y
Just to say before we um, do go that we've got a meal, we've got a meal here tonight um, for the helpers, people who can help them. We have a couple of free places. So if anyone's not booked into the meal but would like a meal with us, please to, please have a ch ask Jill here um, and we'll be able to fit you in, hopefully. So first come to serve on that one. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Sorry, sorry, yes. It's Seven drinks to seven thirty food. Um, Upstairs in, in the olive bar, which is where the zine making was, and the bar will be open up there. So even if you don't want to, if you don't want to book in on food, you want to come and join us for a drink. That's yeah. also lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we look to have you with us. And if you haven't seen the zines yet, um, please go yeah. and And also, we've got our little magazine project. They're all free. The little zines there. If you haven't really picked any of them up. We've still got a few copies of the sign there, and they're on a on, uh, cheap recipe for today. And yeah, and the zines are all still upstairs, I think. Yeah. Yeah, they're still there. So have a look at them. And embroidery, and embroidery stuff yeah. there. If, if you haven't, if you don't subscribe to a sign, it really is, I mean, worthwhile, isn't it? Mm. 14 pounds a year, which is nothing really for, for, for what you get. And, and you oh, buy it, and you can buy it from Atticus Books, yes. Um, and the line but, also starts stocking it in Gregson Centre soon. Oh, oh yeah. 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 Gregson Centre. I've just told spoke with Charles, and he said they might get copies in Gregson Centre. Yeah. Until yeah. then, you can get it from Atticus, yeah. but it's best to subscribe. Is but that the other yeah. bonus if you live in Lancaster is that Crack try to organise a regular meeting where what we do is discuss the latest issue of Asylum. Uh, so, so it gets a chance to read it and then come and talk about mm -hmm. it with, with some friends. Yeah, we do just, just in person and online as well. We do some of the yeah, lines. yeah, sometimes, yes. Yeah. yeah. So, just to plug crap, we, we've been going for, I can't remember now, yeah. 11, 11, 11 years. years. And in my it, my my, def, my definition of what we do is that we try to start conversations and uh, and we don't try to do a lot more than that. But uh, when you talk to about finding a space in Lancaster for people who don't have access to the books, I think that's kind of part yeah. also of Krampus. Mm -hmm. That people meet, not us. They're wrong. Yeah. 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 If anyone's not on the crowd mailing list, there's you can add your address in there so then you can get information. You're meeting every month, I think it's every month it's that you meet. Yeah. 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 Roughly every month. But yeah. Yeah. We do all kinds of things, visits to projects, walks, reading yeah. groups, film. Over the over lockdown we watch films as well. We yeah. did we did online. Yeah. We used to, we, we had, just before lockdown, we got a grant for uh, a film club, but then we couldn't meet, so we couldn't hire theatres, we couldn't uh, shoot, hire films, right? so we just met online. But this was from the lottery, they were really good, and they said, just spend it on what you want. <laughs> 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 but we, exi we exist from one £500 grant to the next. Mm. So we, we haven't got a bank account. We, we had, when we applied to the Eric Wright Fund, was, and we, we had to have it paid into the Gregson Bank account. So, do you want to be in partnership with us? Have you got a bank account? <laughs> 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 An organisational bank account, not individual. What's the Eric Wright Fund? <laughs> Bob, what's the Eric Wright Fund? Uh, so, well, Eric Wright is a national construction company and they give out, um, well, a grant and trust funds nationally anyway, but in the Lancaster area, uh, we administer the fund on behalf of the Eric Wright Charity Trust, so CDS administer that. Oh. And the um, decision locally was to target the funding to grassroots community organisations. So any organisation that... Um, has an annual turnover of less than 50,000 can apply, and it's only for a maximum amount of 500 pounds. Well, 500 pounds for small grassroots organisations can 
do a lot of good. Yeah. So uh, we have a current round. Just oh, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. When does it close? When does it close? Uh, not till November. Um, so round uh, 22nd of November. 22nd of November okay. is the closing date for next applications. Um, and the decisions are pretty much, the panel meets usually about a week after the deadline and the decisions are made within 24 hours of that. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a fairly informal process. It's not a war and peace application because we recognise it's £500, you're not just £500, you know, it's, it's small detail, uh, but you do have to be a constituted group to apply for it. Yeah. This made, you know, made this state possible. Mm. Yes. Can we just ask another, sorry, can I just ask another question? Is it, if it's a constituted group, can it be a constitu- If you, is it something that you have to have, I mean, constituted group has to be in Lancaster? It has to be uh, working in Lancaster. Oh, so, so it can be based So I can work here, I can apply for something for a group that I want to set up here, but the constitution can be in Hindburn. As long, as long as the work is for in the Lancaster yeah. District. Um, cool. We also ask that you become a member of Lancaster District CVS for any applications for fundings that we administer. Well, that's a, it's a two-minute job. It's just so we get a picture of what the voluntary sector looks like. In, in cool. the... And it does all sorts of things like rent, jubilee, and where things from squirrels, clubs, like a tennis yeah. club, like playing up, playing up, something. Sorry, I know. It's fine. Tennis club, and tennis club, I think it will. We pay, we pay 500 pounds to create a Yeah, or ideas, because I also give advice to set up people who want to set up projects or start organisations up. So, um, yeah, Lancaster District CDS, we have a website, so you'll find my contact details on, on there. Um, and yeah, we'll have a meeting. Just a small detail, pardon, pardon my anger. When you say it constitutes, and what does that mean? In, 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 in ordinary language, the constitution is essentially a set of rules. So you, as an, as an organisation, have a set of rules that says, that, you know, who you are, what you intend to do, what your objectives are, how regularly you're going to meet, whether you're going to have an AGM or not, uh, whether how you, any finances will be dealt with, and what will happen if you dissolve. So it's a set of rules that are signed by a chair, a secretary, a secretary a treasurer, etc. You have a, a committee. Um, so it's just making sure that there's a little bit of governance yeah. Your community organisation. You don't have to be a registered charity to apply. You just need to be a constituted group mm-hmm. with a, a little bit of structure. Mm-hmm. And, and preferably your own bank account, but if you haven't got an organisational bank account, then you can ride off the back, as Bob said, someone who's willing to be your kind of sponsored bank account. The, we, we, we found just if you're interested, the small charities constitution is is actually very easy to um, use. Yeah. Um, so, which is nothing more like being a proper charity, but it is, does come from the charities uh, commission. Yeah, I have copies of all of those kind of things as well. If people needed templates for constitutions, whether it be for a small community organisation, a small registered charity, or a larger incorporated charity. So. Right, so I think it's, I think we've reached the point of saying thank you all for coming. And, uh, you know, it's uh, the, the day is made by everybody who's sitting here. So um, uh, can we, we can give ourselves a round of applause and then pack everything away. <laughs> Yeah.